Different sources of sugar are different. And in this podcast, I want to focus mostly on high fructose corn syrup and how this one is different than table sugar, than honey, than maple syrup, than fruit, and then starches. And why you should definitely get rid of high fructose corn syrup. On this week's podcast, I wanted to talk about sugar. I wanted to talk about the differences in sugars. And I wanted to talk about maybe why sugar foods like honey, maple syrup, and dairy, or fruit are not the same as high fructose corn syrup, which is not the same as table sugar. This is an interesting conversation, and I begin the conversation with why you might even want to consider eating carbohydrates in your diet. I know a lot of people that listen to my stuff have followed me from my strictly carnivore keto days, and I hope this podcast will help fill in the gaps in that story and explain ideas and benefits of having carbohydrates in your diet. I know many of you who are keto or carnivore fear including carbohydrates, but I encourage you to listen to this podcast about potential downsides of a ketogenic diet. Could it age you faster? There's evidence that it could. Uh, does it increase your cortisol? It does. None of these are good things and the benefits of carbohydrates, where I think you should get your carbohydrates and specific sources of carbohydrates that I think have been conflated in the literature with things like fruit, honey, maple syrup, specifically high fructose corn syrup, how it's harmful for humans. And you definitely want to avoid that and um, help your kids avoid that. But other sources of carbohydrates might not be so bad for you. It might actually improve the quality of your life. So enjoy this podcast on fruit, honey, raw dairy, maple syrup, sugar, and high fructose corn syrup, and a little bit of discussion of ketogenic diets, carbohydrates, and why I think they're beneficial, and why you might not want to do keto much longer. Are all sugars created equally? I don't think so. And in this podcast, I want to break this down for you guys. Now, as I begin, I think even talking about this topic will raise the ire of many in the keto and carnivore communities, maybe people that followed me for the last five years and followed me when I was on a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet. Um, and to those people, I would say, um, just take a deep breath, either hear me out, try and learn from what I'm sharing here, because I think there's a lot more to the sugar story than the keto and carnivore communities talk about. And I think that this can lead to improvements in health for many people. So what am I talking about in this podcast? There is a sugar called high fructose corn syrup. Is this the same as table sugar, which is sucrose? Is this the same as the sugars we find in fruit? Is this the same as the sugars we find in honey? And are these simple sugars, which are either mono or disaccharides, generally speaking, are they the same as starches, long chain polymeric molecules of glucose, either amylose or amylopectin, found in foods like potatoes or other root vegetables, which have these longer chain starch-based carbohydrates. Corn is another good example, and that starch from corn is used to make high fructose corn syrup. So that's what I want to talk about in this podcast. And the overarching idea will be that there are differences between all of those, which have implications for human health. Now, for some people listening to this, uh, the thought may be from the beginning, I don't eat any carbohydrates, so it doesn't matter what source they're in. I don't care what different types of carbohydrates mean for the human body or how they're processed by the human body or how they may be um, bad or good for the human body. But to those people, I would say this. A ketogenic diet can be helpful for humans because why do we do a ketogenic diet? I would say that the majority of people do a ketogenic diet to lose weight. Not a lot of people do a ketogenic diet for sports or athletic performance. I would say that it's pretty safe to uh, suggest that the majority of elite athletes, I would say 99.99% .99 of elite athletes include carbohydrates in their diet, mostly in the form of starches. And we can talk about that in this podcast, but I don't think anyone does a ketogenic diet for sports performance. People may do ketogenic diets for mental performance, but I don't think that that's really necessary to get optimal mental functioning. If you are not sleeping well, if you are addicted to caffeine, like so many are in the health space, um, then you may be on a roller coaster of inadequate or less than optimal mental performance. If you are using a ketogenic diet for mental performance, for mental clarity, then perhaps there are applications of that diet in the short term. But you probably don't need to be that mentally clear or at that apex, if you imagine it that, uh, of your mental prowess 100% of the time. 
And I would argue in this podcast that you don't want to be in ketosis all of the time for a variety of reasons. I've spoken about this many times on the podcast in the past based on my experiences and literature that I continue to learn and share with you all. Implicit in that whole conversation <laughs> is the assertion that I will make that I don't believe that a ketogenic diet has been proven to give you better mental performance than someone who is well-slept, unstressed, moderately exercised, and is getting good nutrition from their food. Subjectively, I don't feel any different now mentally than I was on a ketogenic diet. Or I should say, I certainly don't feel like my ketogenic diet days were better for me in terms of mental clarity or academic prowess than I am now. There is a bump in the road that happens when you go from a ketogenic diet to eating carbohydrates in your diet again. And that is because when you eliminate carbohydrates from your diet and you go into ketosis for a few days, a week, months, or hopefully not years, your body becomes physiologically insulin resistant. Yes, those of you in ketosis are insulin resistant. Take an oral glucose tolerance test, you'll see it. Do an insulin clamp and you will see it. Your body has adjusted to what it perceives as starvation and made your muscles and your liver to a significant extent insulin resistant to spare the glucose that is being made mostly via gluconeogenesis for tissues that prefer it. The brain, the adrenals, the testicles, the ovaries, the gonads, et cetera, things like this, red blood cells. So you are insulin resistant when you are on a ketogenic diet. This is medical truth. This is not the same pathology. This is not the same pathophysiology as insulin resistance related to, I would say, diabetes, which is inappropriate um, gluconeogenesis at the level of the liver and inappropriate release of non-esterified fatty acids from the adipose tissue signaling to the muscles in the periphery that they should be insulin resistant. But all of it begins at the level of the adipose tissue, the fat tissue. I've spoken about this in the past. So physiologic insulin resistance related to a low carb or ketogenic diet is not the same insulin resistance you get from diabetes or I would say metabolic dysfunction, but in some ways they have similarities, meaning that the muscles, the liver, other tissues in the body will refuse to respond to the actions of insulin in both of those situations. That's why we call it insulin resistance. Now, why would you want to include carbohydrates in your diet? Maybe you're someone that already includes carbohydrates for athletic performance just because you've always included them. Or maybe you're somebody who's on a ketogenic or carnivore diet and you're watching this, um, making a voodoo doll of me and sticking it with a fork and uh, you're not liking me talking about carbohydrates. Let me suggest this to you. What is your free testosterone? What is your total testosterone? What is your sex hormone binding globulin? If you could measure it, what are your body's levels of methylglyoxal? We know them to be higher on a ketogenic diet. And methylglyoxal is an advanced glycation end product that I'll speak about a little more in this podcast that we know is harmful for the human body. What is your free T3? What are your other thyroid metrics? What's your sleep like? What are your electrolytes like? How many different electrolyte drinks do you need to use on a daily basis to prevent debilitating cramping? <laughs> How often do your legs cramp in the morning when you're in bed or when you're doing uh, activities that may require sustained tonicity of the muscles? I remember when I was ketogenic on a carnivore diet, I couldn't really rock climb anymore because I would get such bad muscle cramps. So to those of you who may have found benefit with a ketogenic or carnivore diet, I would say, do you have those things? Do you know those things? These are all things that come back into balance when you add carbohydrates to your diet. Your electrolytes will improve because a postprandial, that is after eating signal from insulin, is needed for the kidneys to hold on to electrolytes. I've shown that study. I'll show it again here in a moment. Your hormones will get better. Your sex hormone binding globulin will go down, which means that your free uh, androgens and other sex hormones will go up, which leads to better sexual performance, better libido, et cetera. These are all good things for the human body. Your sleep will get better. So many of these things will improve when you add carbohydrates to your diet. This is why I would urge you to consider that though a ketogenic diet can be useful for weight loss, there are many ways to lose weight. And a ketogenic diet is not the only one. It is actually, from medical research, shown to not really be that much better than other ways of losing weight. I think the best way to lose weight is to not be hungry. And while a ketogenic diet may help you achieve that, I think the best way to achieve that sustainably without negatively impacting these other metrics, your sex hormones, your sex hormone binding globulin, your electrolytes, your sleep, 
um, your thyroid function, other hormonal function, is to include carbohydrates in your diet. But Paul, you may say, carbohydrates cause diabetes. Repeat after me. Carbohydrates do not cause diabetes. Even glucose, even sucrose does not cause diabetes. There are studies from the 60s and 70s in which 85% carbohydrate diets were given to patients with diabetes and they saw improvements in metabolic function. In fact, the diabetes was reversed over time. So if you believe that carbohydrates cause diabetes or you've been told that carbohydrates cause diabetes, look for the research that supports that. It doesn't exist. There are nuances there. And when you are diabetic, when you are insulin resistant, when you are obese, you have some underlying metabolic dysfunction, probably related to broken fat cells, related to seed oil consumption and other stressors in your life, leading to baseline levels of cortisol being high. And that can lead to glucose intolerance, meaning that when you eat sugars, or you eat carbohydrates, your blood sugar may go up, but that doesn't mean that those carbohydrates caused your diabetes. That is a symptom rather than the cause. And as I said in the last podcast on artificial sweeteners, I think there has been too much focus to the detriment of many people on glucose levels in the blood. Yes, if your blood glucose goes to 180 milligrams per deciliter after eating, that's probably too high. 200, 220, that's very high. That's too many carbohydrates. That's a problem. But for those of you who are on a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet and you eat some fruit or you eat some honey and you see your blood sugar go to 110, 120, 130, 140, or even 150, I would urge you to take a deep breath and relax. That's not pathological. It just means that your body isn't used to seeing those sugars, those carbohydrates, and it will get better over time. In fact, it takes about 72 hours for your body to re- create the metabolic machinery needed to process carbohydrates. So yes, you are physiologically insulin resistant on a ketogenic diet, on a carnivore diet, but that will reverse within 72 hours when you re-include carbohydrates in your diet. So I see this in the comments from time to time. People say, I can't include fruit. My blood sugar goes crazy. That's because your body has turned off the machinery to process the glucose. You have mothballed it. You've created a mothballed fleet <laughs> of metabolic machinery because you're not taking in any glucose. You've put it in storage in the attic next to the Christmas decorations from 2015, next to that old Christmas tree and those lights that don't really work and the fake Santa. It's, it's up there. It just needs to be taken out, dusted off, and plugged back in. And it takes a little while to do that. It takes you a few days to put up your Christmas decorations. You can't just do it overnight. So this is what I'm saying in this podcast. Different sources of sugar are different. And in this podcast, I want to focus mostly on high fructose corn syrup and how this one is different than table sugar, than honey, than maple syrup, than fruit, and then starches, and why you should definitely get rid of high fructose corn syrup. And if you know people who are eating high fructose corn syrup, you should share with this with them. And the largest consumers of high fructose corn syrup are probably kids. So if you have kids, this is a reason to help your kids understand that is a very harmful sugar for humans for reasons I'll discuss in this podcast. But I also, in this podcast, want to help you all understand that research done with high fructose corn syrup or with sugar-sweetened beverages in the United States that almost certainly contain high fructose corn syrup are not necessarily translatable to humans consuming things like honey, maple syrup, and fruit. I'm not a huge fan of processed sucrose. I don't see a reason that humans should eat table sugar. But as you'll see in this podcast, table sugar is very different than high fructose corn syrup. What happens when you make table sugar from usually beets or other sources of sugar, sugar cane, but that doesn't happen much anymore, is that you're extracting a sucrose molecule. As you'll see, high fructose corn syrup comes from corn. It starts out as exclusively glucose and then gets turned into high fructose corn syrup. We'll talk about that. But when you are taking the sucrose out of things like beets, you're losing all the nutrients in the beets, which go with the sugar. When we have sugars in fruit, they're packaged with many nutrients. If you look at the nutrient analysis of orange juice, a food that may either create um, happiness in your body when you think about drinking delicious glass of fresh squeezed orange juice, something that I've been doing very recently and really enjoying, there's a good amount of thymine in orange juice. That's not surprising. B1 is needed to process carbohydrates. Mangoes the same way. If you eat a mango, there's a good amount of thymine in that mango. Even maple syrup contains nutrients. It contains manganese. It has riboflavin. Honey contains nutrients. These unprocessed or minimally processed forms of sugar in the human diet actually contain nutrients that can help you live a more rich life. I'm not a fan of consuming sugar 
like sucrose that has been stripped of those nutrients. But it's important to understand that that's probably not even the end of the world if you're consuming it from time to time. What you do want to avoid, the majority of the time, I would say all of the time, is high fructose corn syrup. I think that our lives are complicated. And if I can help you understand what I believe are the biggest impacts negatively on your health, then you can focus what is probably a limited bandwidth because of your job and your family and all these things in your life on avoiding those certain few things. If you saw the podcast earlier this month in which I talked about how to do an animal-based diet, animal-based diet 101, 2023 edition, I spoke about the fact that we're doing Animal Base 30 right now at Hardened Soil. It's not too late to sign up. You can go to animalbase30.com to sign up for that. And I spoke about the fact that if you want to eliminate foods from your life to be healthier, I think seed oils are at the top, but number two or number three is high fructose corn syrup. Not eliminating all sugars. I don't think you need to do that. If you're going to eat sugar, I would make the majority of it honey, fruit, maple syrup, things like that. If you get a little sucrose from time to time, I don't think it's the end of the world. It is devoid of those nutrients, but if you're getting the majority of your sugars from fruit, honey, and maple syrup, you will do well in the long term. And I know that's a crazy thing to say because many of you are in the keto and carnivore perspective, but hear me out, listen to the podcast, think about this, be curious, make your own decisions. Ultimately, I just hope this information helps you thrive. But as I said earlier, I think a lot of people get stuck in a mental game of chasing their tail on ketogenic and carnivore diets where they can't or won't add any source of carbohydrates because they see their blood sugar go up. And again, I don't think that is harmful for humans. As I shared in the last podcast, there's plenty of good evidence that glycemic index, glycemic load, these indicators of how fast your blood sugar rises or how fast your blood sugar might rise based on the quantity of food you're eating are really bad predictors of cardiovascular outcomes. What is a good predictor of a cardiovascular outcome or long-term health is your insulin sensitivity which you can assay with a fasting insulin. Getting overly focused on what your blood sugar does, I think leads to more harm than it does good for humans. Changed my life. Check out this review on her package from Heart and Soil Supplements. I am in the late stages of perimenopause. As a result, I was often irritable, angry, and felt like I was in a fog, just going through the motions in my daily life. I hadn't even realized how bad it was until I felt the effects of this product. Within 10 days, I felt like a heavy blanket had been lifted from me and I was able to feel a sense of calm I hadn't felt in a long time. I'm so grateful to this company and the friend who introduced me to it for improving my life. And here's another one. <laughs> this other person says, life-changing. This product is amazing. Completely balanced my hormones and menstrual cycle in a matter of weeks taking her package. My cycle was essentially painless, much lighter, which is something I've never experienced. So if you are a lady... <laughs> and you have any of these issues or you know someone who is having these issues, check out her package from Heart and Soil Supplements. This is one of our most popular supplements for ladies. And you can find us at heartandsoil.co. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to optimal radical health. January is not over. You can still join us for Animal Base 30, animalbase30.com to sign up. It's our free challenge. It is not too late to change your way of living with how you eat and how you live on a daily basis and get your year started right. Heartandsoil.co to get her package, or join us for Animal Base 30 at animalbase30.com. I also think that people fear insulin when in fact this hormone is necessary for human life and has many beneficial roles in the human body. You want your fasting insulin to be low, which suggests that you are insulin sensitive. But a rise in postprandial insulin triggered by either protein or carbohydrates or both, yes, protein will trigger a rise in postprandial insulin, but usually not to levels high enough to allow people to maintain their electrolyte status. This is why people on ketogenic diets run into so many problems. A postprandial rise in insulin is a beneficial thing for humans because of this. This is the article I mentioned earlier that I was going to share with you. The title is Insulin's Impact on Sodium Transport and Blood Pressure in Obesity and Diabetes. And they say that in this review, we present the current state of understanding with regard to the regulation of the major renal sodium transporters by insulin in the kidney. Several groups using primary cell culture have demonstrated that insulin can directly increase the activity of the epithelial sodium channel, the sodium phosphate co-transporter, the sodium hydrogen exchanger type 3, and the sodium potassium ATPase in the kidney. This is all to say that insulin signaling in the human body is necessary to control your electrolytes. And if you are not eating carbohydrates in your diet, you will run into electrolyte problems. And this is something that many of you are familiar with. I was certainly familiar with it. On my carnivore days, I tried as hard as I could to combat it with supplemental magnesium, supplemental potassium, which is dangerous, 
supplemental sodium in the form of more salt, more salt, more salt. And it helps a little, but it never really helped. And like I said, I would get pretty bad recalcitrant cramping. Um, and I think that many of you are suffering with that. And the answer, like I said, is carbohydrates along with many other things that we're going to discuss in this podcast. So don't fear carbohydrates. Don't fear a blood sugar rise when you eat carbohydrates. I think that these will be helpful for you long-term. The transition back out of keto is a little bumpy for a lot of people, but I think it's worth doing in the long run for reasons that I mentioned earlier. Hormones, sex hormone binding globulins, sleep, mood, thyroid, your baseline metabolism, and electrolytes, as we talked about with insulin signaling. Connected with that, I think that in order to do this topic the full justice, I need to discuss problems with a ketogenic diet that some of you may not be aware of. What are the problems with a ketogenic diet, you say? Well, it's been shown pretty clearly that as you limit your carbohydrates, your cortisol goes up. Cortisol is a powerful stress hormone that has nothing good to do in the human body most of the time. If you're running from a tiger, yeah, cortisol is probably a good thing. If a crocodile is chasing me around the water while I'm surfing, cortisol is maybe good. But most of the time, you don't want your cortisol to be high. When you restrict your carbohydrates, in the study I'll show you, they restricted them to 4% of the macronutrient ratios. 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1, it's a mouthful, that's the enzyme that makes cortisol went up and cortisol levels in the blood throughout the body in these individuals were known to be higher. So yes, eating a ketogenic diet raises your cortisol long-term and why wouldn't it? It's perceived evolutionarily in our bodies as a stressful state. So I would urge you to consider <laughs> that you are upregulating one of the most powerful stress hormones that has aging effects in human physiology when you are eating ketogenic diet. Also, as I mentioned earlier, methylglyoxal, an important advanced glycation end product, which doesn't look good for humans at all, is upregulated by the ketogenic diet. So I'll show you both of those studies and then I'll move on and we'll really um, dig into carbohydrates a bit more. This is the study that I would suggest you check out if you're interested in cortisol and ketogenic diets. Dietary macronutrient content alters cortisol metabolism independently of body weight changes in obese men. As you can see here, they looked at 17 obese men, four weeks of ad libitum, meaning they could eat as much as they wanted, high fat, low carbohydrate, which is 66% fat, 4% carbohydrate, that's pretty ketogenic, or a moderate fat, moderate carbohydrate, which is 35% fat, 35% carbohydrate diet. Conclusions, a low carbohydrate diet, which is 4% carbohydrates in the study, alters cortisol metabolism independently of weight loss. In obese men, this enhances cortisol regeneration by 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type one and reduces cortisol inactivation by A ring reductases in the liver without affecting subcutaneous adipose 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type one. Alterations in cortisol metabolism may be a consequence of macronutrient dietary content and may mediate effects of diet on metabolic health. As you can see in this study, both groups lost weight at the end of the trial. And in fact, the BMI and the fat mass of high fat, low carb was not statistically different than medium fat, medium carb. So thinking about what you're eating can help you lose weight. You don't have to be ketogenic to do that. As I've said in the past, I think the benefits of a ketogenic diet are in that it controls appetite. But if you think about the quality of your foods and you remove foods, specifically artificial sweeteners, like I talked about in the last podcast, which will hijack your appetite and your insulin signaling, something that many people on ketogenic diets are still eating, high fructose corn syrup, as we'll talk about in this podcast, and seed oils, which will contribute to underlying insulin resistance, your satiety will be better. And you can still lose weight and eat carbohydrates. I'll repeat that statement because it is so important. You can still lose weight. In fact, you can lose an equivalent amount of weight just improving your food quality and eating carbohydrates as you would on a ketogenic diet. And then you have all of the benefits of doing that, which are actually not getting the negatives of a ketogenic diet, hormonal interruptions, electrolyte issues, sleep issues, all these things that come along with that. So first problem with a ketogenic diet, increasing cortisol clearly shown in the medical research. Second problem, methylglyoxal. We'll talk about that right now. As I mentioned, methylglyoxal is a advanced glycation end product, which looks pretty bad for humans. This is an interesting paper. Ketosis leads to increased methylglyoxal production on the Atkins diet. You can see here very clearly stated in this paper that Atkins subjects with ketosis had even greater increases in methylglyoxal, 2.12 fold, as well as acetol and acetone, which increased 4.19 and 7.9 fold respectively. So this is a study to show that methylglyoxal has been measured in patients' 
doing an Atkins diet, both a low carb version and a ketogenic version, and methylglyoxal, a harmful advanced glycation end product in humans, was significantly raised in both of those situations. Now, this is something that I was never warned about when I was doing a ketogenic diet. No one was really speaking about this when I was talking about this. And so I wanted to bring it to people's attentions that I fear that in many ways, methylglyoxal, cortisol, that a ketogenic diet will age you faster <laughs> than if you are eating carbohydrates. And that is not a good thing. We all only get a certain number of heartbeats, a certain number of breaths in our lives. I don't really want that wick to burn faster when I'm trying to do something that is health promoting. As I mentioned earlier, there are many ways to lose weight outside of a ketogenic diet. And just because you're losing weight doesn't mean something is healthy. Just because a ketogenic diet leads to weight loss doesn't mean that it's healthy for you in the long term. Is it possible that, that ketogenic diet is in so many ways burning the wick of your life faster? If a ketogenic diet is aging you faster, that's dangerous and something for you to think about. Consider this paper, oxidative stress and aging is methylglyoxal, the hidden enemy. It's a highly reactive dicarbonyl metabolite formed during glucose protein and fatty acid metabolism, especially during fatty acid metabolism. As we know, during ketosis, levels are 2.12 times higher on an Atkins diet with ketosis than they are doing glucose metabolism. They're elevated in hyperglycemia and other conditions. An excess of methylglyoxal formation can increase reactive oxygen production and cause oxidative stress. Methylglyoxal reacts with proteins, DNA, and other biomolecules and is a major precursor of advanced glycation end products. I'll let you guys read through this article in detail if you'd like, but is this something that is accelerating aging? Uh, I fear that it may be. So I know that many of you who are interested in these diets are doing so for the right reasons. And the people who are discussing these diets in a positive light on the social media are doing it for the right reasons. They want to help you. But I think it's important that we understand the whole perspective when we are making a decision about how to structure our diets for optimal health, optimal aging, optimal longevity. Refer to the longevity podcast I did last year if you're curious about how an animal-based diet, which is what I do advocate for, which is like a carnivore diet, but includes uh, organs and meat, also fruit, honey, raw dairy, other sources of carbohydrates. So this is my evolution, as many of you who are familiar with my work will know. So those are the two major problems I see with ketosis. And there are many minor problems, electrolyte imbalances, hormones, sex hormone binding globulin, sleep disturbances, all things that I talked about earlier. But the major ones are cortisol connected with 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type one and methylglyoxal. So again, that is the framework of this conversation. And this is a podcast primarily about different types of sugar. But I think anytime I'm talking about different types of sugar in the communities that listen to this work that I'm doing, it's important to frame why I would even talk about this or why I even think you should include carbohydrates in your diet in the first place, because I do believe that they are beneficial for humans. Those are the reasons. Hopefully that's a good framework. All right. So what type of carbohydrates should you include in your diet if you choose to include carbohydrates? This is something that I hope people will experiment with. And really, this is the reason that I'm doing this podcast, because I believe and I'm always open to learning and growing. I don't want to become calcified and ossified. I want to keep learning and growing. But I believe that fruit and honey, maple syrup, lactose from milk, simple sugars, either mono or disaccharides, most of them are disaccharides, um, are the best sources of carbohydrates for humans. Most of the world conflates studies done with high fructose corn syrup with sugar in these substances. And I've seen it talked about in the nutrition space, in the ketogenic space, many times paraphrasing, honey is just sugar. This is what I'm trying to help um, disentangle in these podcasts. So I believe those are the best sources of carbohydrates for humans. Why? Because they are the easiest to digest. And I think starches are problematic for humans in many different ways. Starches often come with higher amounts of fiber, which I think can be damaging and harmful to the human gut. The fruit is going to have fiber in it. If you're worried about fiber, fruit has fiber. There's, you're not going to be able to get fruit or, or even fruit juice without some fiber in your diet. So if you're worried about fiber and short-chain fatty acids, that's the whole separate podcast on the nuances of gut bacteria, um, then you can go down that rabbit hole. But it's not really a fiber conversation in this podcast. Though I will mention that there's clear evidence from Stanford that plant fiber doesn't increase alpha diversity. It's something I've spoken about in the past. And what does increase alpha diversity in the gut are things like fermented foods, whether it's a raw milk, a fermented milk, like a kefir, even a sauerkraut. If you ferment cabbage, it's going to make it less toxic for humans. We know that this happens. This is one of the reasons that traditional cultures ferment 
vegetables is they're trying to detoxify them. If you have questions about plant toxins and why you might not want to eat vegetables, please refer to the previous podcast earlier this month on Animal Based 101 or join us at Heart and Soil uh, for Animal Based 30 this month, animalbased30.com or heartandsoil.co to join the tribe as we're doing that. So to quickly support my belief that honey, maple syrup, fruit, these simpler versions of carbohydrates are better for humans, I want to share some studies on honey. In the past, I've shared previous studies on fruit juice, like red-orange juice, improving endothelial function. I specifically want to focus on honey in this podcast because honey gets a lot of, I believe, undeserved hate, shall I say, in the nutrition communities. But there's a lot of good research that honey is beneficial for humans. You don't get much simpler in terms of carbohydrates than honey. Then I'll talk about why I think starches are harmful in more detail. And then we'll close the podcast with a pretty deep dive into high fructose corn syrup, what it is and how it's different than these other ones and why you don't want your kids drinking high fructose corn syrup. So I think that the main question people are going to be asking at this point is, I have diabetes, I have prediabetes, or I'm obese, I can't eat carbohydrates. And I don't think this is true. And there's actually good evidence from interventional trials in diabetics and those with metabolic syndrome showing improvements when honey is given. And I use this as a model system, a model exploratory literature search to suggest that simple sugars like honey do not necessarily cause worsening of metabolic syndrome parameters, fasting insulin, fasting blood glucose, or even obesity in people with diabetes. Will a simple sugar raise your blood sugar? Yes, it will raise your blood sugar. But as I mentioned earlier, there's not good medical evidence to connect that directly with worse health outcomes. And I know this is causing you guys to have smoke coming out your ears and to, your minds are blown, but your blood sugar going up to massive levels is not a good thing. But if you're eating some carbohydrates, even if you're diabetic or obese or have some degree of metabolic dysfunction or prediabetes, that's not necessarily a bad thing that your blood sugar is going up. What you want is your fasting blood sugar to go down and your fasting insulin to go down. That's what the problem is. It's insulin resistance. And the elevated blood sugars you see are not related to the food you eat. They're related to inappropriate gluconeogenesis happening at the level of your liver and that is because you are insulin resistant. And once you correct that insulin resistance by removing things like seed oils and artificial sweeteners from your diet, your blood sugars will come down even if you are eating carbohydrates. Will you have a postprandial rise in your blood sugar? Yes, always. I do. It's okay. My fasting blood sugar remains very low, 85 last time I checked. My fasting insulin is three. It's probably better than most carnivore and keto people. And I eat 300 grams of carbohydrates a day right now because I'm surfing so much. You don't need that much. If you're curious on what macros I might recommend for you, carbohydrates, protein, and fat, you can always go to carnivoremd.com. It's a free animal-based calculator there. So consider this study, uh, the effects of natural honey consumption in diabetic patients. Yes, in diabetic patients, an eight-week randomized clinical trial. You can see here the conclusions, high level. Eight-week consumption of honey can provide beneficial effects on body weight and blood lipids of diabetic patients. I've spoken about this trial in the past. They say that there is an increase in hemoglobin A1C. They recommend cautious consumption of this food by diabetic patients. But I think that, again, the most important metric to track is your fasting insulin, your fasting blood sugar. And I'll show you as you dig into this study that this is not a small amount of honey these people are eating. Again, first two weeks, one gram per kilogram per day. Second two weeks, 1.5. Third two weeks, two grams. Last two weeks, 2.5 kilograms per day of honey. I'm 75 kilograms, guys. These people at my weight were eating 180 plus grams of honey per day. 180 plus grams of honey per day, that's 10 tablespoons. And they lost weight and their fasting blood sugars got better. Look, body weight, honey group goes down in a significant way. That's what the three asterisks are there. So they didn't gain weight. Look at how much their fasting blood sugar dropped. 153 to 124. You can see the standard deviations here in the paper. Their hemoglobin A1C went up from 7.1 to 7.7. .7. Yes, they had higher blood sugars, but they lost weight and they became more insulin sensitive. Look at the hemoglobin A1C went up in the control group, 7.1 to 7.3. This is a difference of in the honey group, the end fasting blood sugar average was 167. In the control group, 157. 10 milligrams per deciliter difference overall. And the fasting blood sugar improved significantly in the honey group. They got more insulin sensitive and they lost more weight 
than the control group. So giving them honey had positive effects. This would be an interesting study if there were no negative effects, but this actually provided positive effects. There are multiple studies like this, and you can look at these um, on review papers, or I'll just show you one more. Effects of daily honey consumption solution uh, on hematological indices and blood levels of minerals and enzymes. This is in normal individuals. Um, honey reduced serum and immunoglobulin E by 34%, increased serum copper, reduced fasting blood sugar by 5%, even in normal individuals, reduced lactic uh, acid dehydrogenase, LDH, by 41%, decreased creatine kinase by 33%. These are all things that are associated with positive things in humans. Increased blood vitamin C by 47%. There's plenty of positive things associated. Increased glutathione reductase by 7% in these humans. If you'd like more review papers, here's a review of the protective effects of honey against metabolic syndrome. I'll read the title again because it's so striking. A review of the protective effects of honey against metabolic syndrome. This study um, says that antioxidant properties of honey may help in reducing oxidative stress, one of the central mechanisms of metabolic syndrome. Lastly, honey protects the vasculature from endothelial dysfunction and remodeling benefits of non-processed sugars like honey. This paper is a review paper. Again, there are multiple studies cited here that you guys can dig into, including the uh, randomized controlled trial I showed. Here's a whole table of anti-diabetic effects of honey in clinical and preclinical studies. Some of these are in animal studies and some of these are in humans, as I mentioned. So there are many review papers like these showing um, that honey has beneficial effects in humans. And again, whether you're diabetic, whether you're obese, I even in those situations, don't believe that you need to fear honey. Obviously eat it in moderation, but having some carbohydrates will provide so many benefits, even for those individuals. Last paper, honey and cardiovascular risk factors in normal individuals and in patients with diabetes or dyslipidemia. You can see here, more studies are exploring other aspects of honey activity, such as its effects on blood sugar, body weight, lipid profile, C-reactive protein, nitric oxide, pro-inflammatory prostaglandins, homocysteine, growing evidence and scientific data suggests the use of honey in patients with diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. So the authors of this paper <laughs> from 2013 are suggesting in the abstract, the data may support the use of honey, a simple sugar in patients with diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. And if you've watched my blood work podcast in which I've shared all of my blood work with you guys, you'll see that though I would be considered a healthy individual because I've never been obese in my adult life, nor have I had diabetes, I remain very insulin sensitive despite my consumption of significant amounts of carbohydrates. I think that blood work is a foundation for many of these discussions. And I hope that more people in the health space will share their blood work um, because if we don't know what someone's blood work is actually showing, then do we know that the person suggesting an idea is actually healthy at baseline? So I think that um, it would be very beneficial for people in the carnivore communities, people in ketogenic communities, people who disagree with what I'm saying to also share their blood work their fasting insulin, their fasting blood sugar, maybe wear a continuous blood glucose monitor, look at indices, glycemic variability, look at things like HSCRP, their fasting uh, insulin, as I said, uh, testosterone, free testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, cortisol, prolactin. If you listen to the podcast with Georgie Dinkov, we went through a lot of labs, uh, but you can see that there are many of these metrics that are important to look at that might give some sense of hormonal health, sexual health, actual insulin sensitivity at a baseline level. Um, that I think will add a lot of degrees of um, nuance to the conversations and help people understand um, what is actually going on beneath the surface and what is really healthy and what's not. So why do I have concerns about starches? I am concerned that starches may be damaging or problematic for the human gut, potentially raising things like endotoxin and leading to problems downstream in humans. Subjectively, I find that I feel better when I don't eat starches. And I don't want the things that come along with many of those starches. Many of those starches are in things like grains. I don't want to eat grains because I don't really want to eat phytic acid, a molecule that chelates minerals and prevents their absorption. I don't want to eat gluten, a molecule that is a clearly a lectin that is harmful for many people's guts. I don't want to eat things like oxalates that come in beans or grains or nuts or seeds. And many of the root vegetables do come with problematic things associated with them, whether they're choconine or other solanines and white potatoes or other defense chemicals, even in sweet potatoes. Uh, 
If you want to eat roots as a source of your carbohydrates and you feel like you do better on those, then I would recommend cutting the skin off and cooking the heck out of them. I have just found, and intuitively, and based on the literature, I think that fruit is the least defended part of plants, and it's likely going to have less of these defense chemicals, which is the whole reason I got interested in keto and carnivore in the first place. What are these plant chemicals doing in humans? If you're thriving and you think you do well on pressure-cooked white potatoes without the skin, great. But I do have concerns about their effects on the gut, and I think there are better sources of carbohydrates. I've been talking to some professional athletes recently, guys who are 6'1", 6'4", 220, 230 pounds. And for those individuals, it may be difficult to get enough carbohydrates from fruit and honey every day, especially when they're traveling. In that situation, perhaps white rice is the best uh, option for carbohydrates. Without the hull, less arsenic, pressure-cooked white rice is going to detoxify many of the lectins in there. Again, it's a grain. It's going to come with some added issues, but perhaps that's the most benign for many people who really want large amounts of carbohydrates. I don't eat white rice. I experimented with it years ago, but I feel better on fruit, honey, maple syrup, lactose from milk, et cetera. And I'll say that as a 5'9", 165-pound individual who's pretty active, I can easily get 300 grams of carbohydrates a day from milk, maple syrup, honey, fruit, fruit juice. I've got a juicer. I, like I said, I make fresh squeezed orange juice every day in my house from oranges here in Costa Rica. So there are options, but I think the problem for many people is if they're traveling, professional athletes, and they don't have the ability to make their own fruit juice, they're sort of at the mercy of what the teams are feeding them. In that situation, I can understand maybe some extremely boiled potatoes without the skin or white rice. I think white rice would be my option for the least harmful carbohydrate source in those situations. But if you're at home and you have the ability to prepare your own food, I think it's worth an experiment to cut out those starches. There's also an interesting set of literature in cows showing how harmful grains and starches are. This is relevant both to the grain-fed cattle conversation and the um, grain-fed human conversation. So in, in cows, it's well-documented that ruminal uh, lipopolysaccharides, so the rumen um, of cows is one of their stomachs, uh, their LPS concentration, so the lipopolysaccharide concentration, and the inflammatory response is increased in during grain feeding. So the title of this paper is Ruminal Lipopolysaccharide, that's endotoxin, concentration and inflammatory response during grain-induced subacute ruminal acidosis in dairy cows. Basically, when you feed a dairy cow uh, grains, they get subacute ruminal acidosis, which isn't a good thing. They abbreviate it as SARA, S-A-R-A, and they have increased lipopolysaccharide. This is what I'm concerned about, that in humans who are eating lots of starches and grains or tuberous things that are not really well cooked, that are going to have a lot of starches in them, are we having increased lipopolysaccharide, increased endotoxin happening in humans too? And could that lead to systemic inflammation, et cetera, et cetera? Here's another paper showing the same things. It's almost the same title, but it's a different paper. Ruminal lipopolysaccharide and inflammation during grain adaptation and subacute ruminal acidosis in steers. So again, if you have questions about whether you should be eating grain-fed or grass-finished meat, perhaps those articles will help you understand that feeding a cow grains creates subacute ruminal acidosis, increased lipopolysaccharide into the organism, inflammation. I think that's a solid amount of evidence that grain feeding cattle leads to inflammation in those cattle, and they may not be the healthiest things for humans to eat, which is why I'm a huge fan of grass feeding, which is why I'm a huge fan of grass feeding and grass finishing, a entirely evolutionarily consistent way of feeding cattle that are going to be eaten by humans, whereas grain finishing is not. That's a whole separate podcast, but again, the concern would be gut inflammation, problems with anti-nutrients coming along with those starches, which is why I choose to eat my carbohydrates from fruit, honey, maple syrup, lactose from dairy. Okay, so at this point in the podcast, let's return to discussions of sugars. We talked a little bit about starches. We talked about amylose, amylopectin. We'll get to that in a moment. We're talking about high fructose corn syrup and how it's made because it's made from corn starch, which is probably one of the reasons it's a problem for humans. But what are the different types of sugars? So we have high fructose corn syrup, you have table sugar, you have fruit, honey, maple syrup, et cetera, lactose from dairy. As I mentioned, these are not all the same. And when we're looking at research into how these things affect humans, we need to be careful that we don't conflate research with high fructose corn syrup or beverages that are likely to contain high fructose corn syrup and say that all sugar-containing foods, fruit, honey, et cetera, are harmful for humans. I showed you all some evidence that honey can be beneficial in many ways. And we talked about the problems with eliminating all carbohydrates from your diet. So let's dig into high fructose corn syrup and why I think this is such a problem. 
I, there are probably not many people listening to this podcast that are consuming high fructose corn syrup, but it sneaks into foods you are eating, things like Gatorade, Powerade, Coca-Cola in the United States contains high fructose corn syrup. Uh, ketchup contains high fructose corn syrup. A lot of salad dressings contain high fructose corn syrup. Some energy bars contain high fructose corn syrup. You should read the labels because high fructose corn syrup is not the same and it looks to be much more problematic for humans than regular sugar, which is interesting. And again, as I mentioned earlier in this podcast, I don't see a role for pure sucrose that is table sugar in the human diet because it's been stripped of the micronutrients that come with carbohydrates in our diet. I actually think that eating sugar cane is probably not that bad for humans, uh, though it is a stem of a plant. And drinking sugar cane juice, well, that's probably going to have some micronutrients in the sugar cane. When I was in Africa with Anthony Gustin, we ate sugar cane. And I thought, man, is this bad for me? It tastes really good. I don't feel bad when I do this. And I think that this is a unprocessed form of sugar. But it's not the same as table sugar because you're taking out the micronutrients in there. But honey, uh, maple syrup is obviously a syrup from trees that's then heated but it has many good nutrients in it. Even things like molasses could be helpful for humans because they are from the sugarcane plant and less refined than a pure table sugar. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's see what the FDA says about high fructose corn syrup. Um, no surprise here. The FDA thinks high fructose corn syrup is just peachy. Um, the FDA does not believe that there are any uh, problems with high fructose corn syrup. Is high fructose corn syrup less safe than other sweeteners? Uh, we are not aware of any evidence, including studies mentioned above, that there's any difference in safety between foods containing high fructose corn syrup 42 or high fructose corn syrup 55 and food containing other similar amounts of nutritive sweeteners with approximately equal glucose and fructose content, such as sucrose, honey, or other traditional sweeteners. Perhaps they're referring to maple syrup, things like that. So HFCS, high fructose corn syrup 42 and 55, just have to do with how much fructose is in the high fructose corn syrup. The 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommend that everyone limit consumption of all added sugars, including high fructose corn syrup and sucrose. I would agree with that at least, but they're not saying there's any problem with it or any dangers. Now, one of the things I came across, um, Georgie actually sent this to me, Georgie Dinkov sent this to me. We did a podcast, we're going to do another one, was that when you look at high fructose corn syrup and you do um, gas chromatography mass spec on it, it has more calories than what are listed on the label of high fructose corn syrup containing commercial beverages. This is really wild, and I'm not sure how the FDA can ignore this or why it hasn't been repeated, though I have some suspicions. They say here that the carbohydrate content of beverages determined after acid hydrolysis were substantially four to five fold higher than the listed values of carbohydrates. As fructose and glucose in high fructose corn syrup may exist as monosaccharides, disaccharides, or oligosaccharides, analysis of the high fructose corn syrup carbohydrate content samples may yield widely different uh, results depending on the degree of hydrolysis of the oligosaccharides. With inclusion of mild acid hydrolysis, all samples showed significantly higher fructose and glucose content than listed on the labels, than the listed values of carbohydrates on the nutrition labels. The underestimation of carbohydrate content in beverages may be a contributing factor in the development of obesity in children. So they were looking at high fructose corn syrup containing beverages and looking to see how many calories were there or how many carbohydrates were actually in those beverages. And once they did acid hydrolysis on the high fructose corn syrup, once they put something in there to break down oligosaccharides, they found significantly higher values for glucose and fructose, leading to four to five fold higher values of carbohydrates than what's on the label. Does this mean that a Coca-Cola in the United States that says it has 140 calories could have upwards of 450 calories based on the way corn syrup is made into high fructose corn syrup? I believe it does. <laughs> and this brings up a lot of problems and a lot of reasons why you shouldn't be eating high fructose corn syrup. When we talk about high fructose, how high fructose corn syrup is made, this may make more sense, but unaccounted for calories might just be the, the tip of the iceberg for problems here. I think it's also possible that there are other contaminants in high fructose corn syrup or these corn starches are creating problems in humans. But one thing that I think is very difficult to argue is that high fructose corn syrup consumption by humans is strongly associated with problems. <laughs> now, there are all sorts of tricks you can do with different epidemiology, but there are clearly studies done by Robert Lustig and others showing that decreased consumption of fructose-containing beverages in the United States in kids leads to improvements in insulin sensitivity. So I'm not sure anyone, how anyone can argue this. And those beverages almost certainly contain high fructose corn syrup because that's what's in beverages today in the United States. Now, 
if we go on down this rabbit hole, there are lots of interesting studies in animals suggesting that high fructose corn syrup is different than sucrose in terms of weight gain in these animals. So this is a science news daily sort of um, summary of an article that I'll show you in a moment. This title is high fructose corn syrup prompts considerably more weight gain than sucrose. You can see here, rats with access to high fructose corn syrup gain significantly more weight than those with access to table sugar, even when their overall caloric intake was the same. Humans are not rats, but there's something going on here. And the study looking at gas chromatography mass spec of high fructose corn syrup suggests that there's something problematic, either excess calories or other problems with high fructose corn syrup that are contributing to this weight gain in rats and probably in humans. And the overall caloric intake of these rats may not actually have been the same. If you go further down the rabbit hole, it's not hard to see there are many problems with high fructose corn syrup in animal studies. This is the study mentioned in that Science Direct article. High fructose corn syrup causes characteristics of obesity in rats, increased body weight, body fat, and triglyceride levels. No surprise there. What is important to note is that when sucrose was given alongside of this equally caloric, um, there were differences and the high fructose corn syrup caused more problems. So what is going on? Is it that there are unaccounted for oligosaccharides related to cornstarch in the high fructose corn syrup leading to excess calories, or is it something else? We'll get to that in one moment. In case you had any hope that high fructose corn syrup was not horrible, effects of high fructose corn syrup on intestinal microbiota structure and obesity in mice. Uh, this one's from Nature, it's from 2022. Um, it changes the microbiome of mice, presumably in a negative way, and led to uh, body weight increases, peri uh, perirenal fat, epididymal fat, and liver fat percentage. So again, when we are looking at studies saying that fructose-containing beverages are problems for humans, we need to be clear about the fact that we're probably seeing studies showing high fructose corn syrup consumption, and this is not the same as regular sucrose, both in animal studies and in humans. As I mentioned, not a huge fan of pure sucrose in humans. There are much better ways to get your carbohydrates. Let's talk a little more about high fructose corn syrup and how it's made. It's made from corn, clearly. It's made from corn starch. There are apparently 8.2 million tons of corn starch used in 2019 for high fructose corn syrup. The corn starch is a polymer. It's either amylose or amylopectin. So it is glucose polymers there's no fructose in corn starch. They have to break that starch down into glucose monomers, which are monosaccharides, and then they have to change that glucose into fructose to make part of it fructose and part of it glucose. They use an enzyme called d xylose isomerase. There probably are synonyms for that enzyme to convert the glucose into the fructose. And then a very high fructose corn syrup, HFCS90, is combined with HFCS42 to make HS, HFCS55. The details are not super important. But what is important is that in the past, part of the process of making high fructose corn syrup involves something called a chloralkali procedure. Now, the Corn Refiners Association of the United States claims that that's no longer in high practice. But there is some good evidence that when it was in practice, that led to significant amounts of mercury contamination in high fructose corn syrup. So I wish this were clearer and I don't know if the Corn Refiners Association is going to come clean about this, but at least in 2009, when this chloralkali procedure was used for high fructose corn syrup, 0.005 to 0.570 micrograms of mercury were found per gram of high fructose corn syrup. That's 0.005 to 0.57 parts per million. When someone is eating 50 grams or 72 grams as the average uh, adolescent child does of high fructose corn syrup per day, that adds up to a lot of mercury. So even within the last two decades, our children were exposed to massive amounts of mercury, potentially from high fructose corn syrup. I hope this chloralkali refinement process has been eliminated from the process of making high fructose corn syrup, but what other contaminants are in there? If you guys saw my reel on Instagram on canola oil, you know that there are contaminants when we are processing these foods. This is probably one of the reasons that processed sugars are harmful for humans to get things from sugar cane into processed sugar or into high fructose corn syrup. We have to refine them in some way. Often there are contaminants left in the food. It's the job of the FDA and the USDA to make sure those are not significant amounts, but 0.57 parts per million mercury in high fructose corn syrup 13 years ago, 
that's problematic for humans. At this point, we could even consider the question of why high fructose corn syrup is even in our food supply, and it has to do with the Sugar Act of 1934 expiring in the 1970s, leading to rising prices of sugar and manufacturers saying, hey, we can make high fructose corn syrup way cheaper than sugar, and that allows us to have higher profit margins on our processed food products. When in doubt, follow the money when it comes to food and human health. So high fructose corn syrup is in foods because it's cheaper than real sugar, quote unquote, and it has absolutely invaded our food supply. As I mentioned, there are so many foods that you or your kids may be eating that you don't even know about that contain this type of sugar that looks much more harmful for humans than even sucrose and certainly than things like maple syrup, honey, fruit, or lactose in dairy. So you want to get this out of your diet, and this will come as no surprise to many of you, but for those of you who weren't aware, this looks to be a really bad thing for humans, both increased calories that are not accounted for on labels, potentially causing inflammation due to undigested starches, potentially increasing endotoxin, potentially being contaminated with mercury or other problems. This is a horrible thing for humans. And it's interesting for me because for the longest time, I couldn't understand what the difference was between table sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and fruit and honey. How can some of them be good and other of them be bad? And so it's been an interesting rabbit hole for me to go down and do this research. But the overarching point of this is twofold. First, to remind you that high fructose corn syrup is not the same as table sugar, certainly not the same as, as honey or any, quote, whole food sources of sugar. And secondly, to help you understand that when you're looking at medical literature, suggesting that fructose-containing foods are bad, medical literature using foods that contain high fructose corn syrup cannot be extended to foods like fruit, honey, and et cetera. Again, my perspective now is that honey and fruit, maple syrup, lactose and dairy, these are good for humans for all the many reasons I mentioned earlier in the podcast, that including carbohydrates in your diet will improve your overall health and that being in ketosis may be harmful for your health and worsen your aging long-term, both because of methylglyoxal, because of increased cortisol related to 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1, and because of hormonal changes, sex hormone binding globulin, electrolytes, you can lose weight, you can be insulin sensitive, you can be metabolically healthy and still include carbohydrates in your diet. If you want to know how to do that, you can always join us for our free Animal Base 30 Challenge at Heart and Soil. Again, it's animalbase30.com. You can do it on your own. You can find resources at my website, carnivoremd.com, where you can put in your body weight, your activity level, and we'll give you a sense of what macros might be right for you in terms of carbohydrates, fat, and protein. I think starting with your macros, understanding how many carbohydrates you might have in your diet is the first place to start. And then building a diet around that composed of the most nutrient-rich, least toxic food for humans is how we thrive. Now, these conversations I think are productive and powerful because health education is something that Western medicine doesn't do a great job of. So I appreciate everyone in the nutrition space, whether they agree with my ideas or not, because I think we're all trying to do the same thing, which is share information with all of you that will lead to better health. And so I'll end the podcast with that sentiment. Um, cheers to you in 2023. Cheers to your better health. And I hope that this information is helpful for you in terms of sorting out why carbohydrates are not harmful for you, different types of carbohydrates, why you might want to include carbohydrates in your diet, um, why you might want to try an animal-based diet. Again, there's an animal-based diet 101 podcast earlier from this year. And why you want to avoid <laughs> allowing your kids or your friend's kids from getting high fructose corn syrup. Um, I think that if you had the choice of giving children table sugar or high fructose corn syrup, the former is gonna be less bad, but still not great. Uh, I think of this for myself anecdotally because my niece and nephew are often given lollipops by my parents. So their grandkids are given lollipops. And I'm thinking, why are you giving them lollipops? Kids like sweet things. We're programmed to like sweet things at humans give them some honey, give them some maple syrup on a pancake made from um, ground beef with bananas and eggs. There are many ways to feed kids sweet foods because they're gonna crave them that are probably good for them. There's a difference between giving them Aunt Jemima's pancake syrup, which is what I had when I was a kid, which is full of high fructose corn syrup, and giving them a real maple syrup, or giving them honey, or giving them a strawberry, or a mango, or a mango in a smoothie, or a banana, or a watermelon. Those are all, I think, beneficial foods for humans other than the Aunt Jemima's, and this is why. So don't fear sugars in the form of fruit, honey, maple syrup, lactose, and dairy. 
avoid high fructose corn syrup and understand that research is different looking at those because of these differences in the way that those foods are prepared and made. So hopefully it's helpful, guys. See you next week.